OK, right, here we go then. I've got 30 minutes. What am I going to say in 30 minutes? I'm going to talk about the primary school that invited uh, boys to dress as girls, inviting gender confusion. So I talk about the Scottish Government's transgender guidance, which keeps an issue of the utmost seriousness secret from parents. So I talk about the teaching in schools that any and every combination of adults, male or female, can form a relationship and have children. Because basically, sperm plus egg plus uterus equals baby. So I talk about the way that the ideal of natural family life is explicitly rejected. And the fact that stating the truth that children ideally need a mum and a dad can end you up on a police database as the perpetrator of a hate incident, he says from personal experience. Should I talk about the way that schools are undermining mental health by encouraging obsessive introspection? We've heard about some of these issues already, haven't I? I could talk about the way that schools are failing to provide the structure, discipline and challenge necessary for character formation. I could talk about the way that schools are making children into political activists instead of virtuous, independently thinking human beings. I could talk about the children's rights movement undermining parental authority and the role of parents. I could talk about the battle of the sexes mentality that's trying to eliminate difference between men and women, even though those differences in many cases are natural and positive. I could talk about the ABM approach to childcare, anyone but mum. The mission of the Scottish Government and the UK Government is to separate mums from their children for as long as possible at the earliest possible stage. I could talk about identity, polit identity politics, the way it's stoking resentment and bringing division in our society. I could talk about restrictions of speech, hate speech legislation, the conversion therapy ban, we've heard a bit about that, but the way we're heading, that will result in parents, religious leaders, and who knows who else facing conviction. I could talk about the demographic problems, we've heard about some of those already. I could talk about the Scottish Family Party's proposals in all these areas, but there's not time. But I think by nature, I'm a teacher, I like explaining things to people, I like helping people to understand uh, new issues. But in a sense, that's what YouTube's for, that's what I do every week uh, on the internet. But in this speech, it's time for something a little bit different. If you want to see our policies and all, these, all this detail, have a look in our policy booklet, have a look on the website. But there's one issue that hasn't been mentioned really, it's been touched on, but it hasn't really been focused on so far. And that's our pro-life policy. Now I always think, if I'm going to speak about being pro-life, what is there to say? Human life's valuable, life in the womb is human life, that, that's it really, that's it. I mean, what else is there to say? How simple can it be? I mean, our new leaflets we've got on this topic, that's exactly the point that they make, to clarify just how clear the issue is. And I think with the pro-life issue, there can be a danger that we get distracted into side issues. I mean, I've been talking recently about the buffer zones. Now, even if it was the case that there were really aggressive pro-life campaigners abusing and assaulting women trying to go into clinics, even if that was true, like they try and make out in the parliament, it's not true, it's a lot of rubbish, but even if it was true, abortion would still be wrong. Now, I believe that women who've had an abortion often experience emotional harms in decades to come. But even if that's not true, abortion would still be wrong. I believe that abortion at home is very dangerous for women. It really presents an unacceptable medical risk. But even if I'm wrong about that, abortion's still wrong. There's a debate going on about viability. Is the fetus viable at 21 weeks? Is it 24 weeks? Where exactly should we draw the line? Doesn't matter. Abortion is still wrong. There's people who argue that the fetus can feel pain during abortion. I believe they're right, and that's a very, very serious issue. But even if I'm wrong, Abortion is still wrong. I believe that uh, suicides among women who've had abortions are more prevalent, and I believe that's related to the abortion. Even if I'm wrong, abortion is still wrong because we value human life. One of my great frustrations in Scotland, I, I call Scotland a debate desert sometimes because you just can't get people to come face to face and discuss these issues. But we want to make people debate the pro-life issue. We want to hear them defending their views. How about Nicola Sturgeon? When abortion was introduced in the Republic of Ireland, in her most self-righteous tone, she announced that she felt joy at that decision. Joy. Douglas Ross, leader of the Scottish Conservatives, he was asked about abortion when he was appointed. He said he's in favour of abortion. Now, just listen to this. He's in favour of abortion. 
in a safe environment for both the women and all involved. I mean, I mean, is that just monumental stupidity? Well, let, let's be charitable, let's be charitable. Let's say instead of that, it just shows how completely unaware of the issue he is. He's never given it any other thought. He's never grappled with his conscience. Why is that? Well, he's been in Scottish politics for decades. He's never been challenged on it. The issue never, has never been put in front of him. What would they say if they had to respond in debate? Well, we don't know, but we want to find out. We want to push the issue up the agenda through local activism. We've talked about that. I think that would be a fantastic thing for local branches to do. And you'll experience some abuse. You'll experience some appreciation. But there might be some people in the middle ground who'll think, well, I hadn't really thought about that. But you know what? Maybe they've got a point there. The other thing you'll experience is people will just flare up and call you everything under the sun in the hope that you'll think, oh, all right, this is not worth it. We'll go home. But they've picked the wrong opponents for that, haven't we? That's not going to happen with the Scottish family problem. Now, abortion, of course, is a sensitive issue. It touches on the personal experience of a lot of people and traumatic experiences for a lot of people. So it's a sensitive issue. So we need to be sensitive as well. On the other hand, though, we're a political party, not a pastoral care agency. Our mission is to save the unborn from death through the political process, through the democratic process. There are other organisations that provide counselling for women with crisis pregnancies, provide practical support, etc., etc. That's all great. We're right behind it. But our part of the battle is different. And our part is a vital role. And we shouldn't feel ashamed of that because we're not doing these other things that might be less controversial. We shouldn't be ashamed of that. Our part in the pro-life movement is equally valuable. Now, you've probably heard in leaders' speeches at party conferences, they often take the opportunity to take a swipe at their opposite numbers in the other parties. I mean, uh, Nicola Sturgeon calls Boris Johnson a charlatan. Uh, Keir Starmer called Boris Johnson trivial at the Labour Party conference. So thought, what could I say about Nicola Sturgeon? <laughs> and then I thought, uh, yeah, but then I thought, I, I really don't need to. I don't need to say anything. Even if she was the nicest, most competent, inspiring, compassionate political leader in the history of the world, even if you believe that, I suspect you probably don't, but even if you did, it doesn't matter. She insists on killing the unborn as a matter of principle. That's all you need to know to reject Nicola Sturgeon and her party and the other parties in the party, etc., etc., etc. Now, Nicola Sturgeon loves calling people shameful. It's one of her favourite things. If you disagree with her, I've got some other view, that's shameful. Well, I believe that killing unborn children is shameful. And that's not hysterical rhetoric, that's just the plain truth. Now, I'm going to run a little... I'm going to run a little argument past you. It's actually in my Christians in Politics books. Do remember to, to take your, uh, your free copy. If you're not a Christian, I still think you'll find that interesting, particularly if, if you're of another uh, religious faith. But I tell this little story. You can use your imagination. We're in, we're in some fictional land. It's a democratic society. It's election time. Uh, there are two parties standing for election. There's Party A and there's Party B. You need to decide who to vote for. Party A... They've got the policy of rounding up, there's a Hindu minority, they're going to round up all the Hindus, put them in concentration camps and kill them all. That's the, the policy of Party A. Party B, they say we're going to round up all the Hindus, put them in concentration camps, but we'll only kill half of them. Right, election day. There's your ballot paper, A or B. Who are you going to vote for? Now people often say, oh, well you vote for Party B, wouldn't you? That lesser of two evils. But I would say surely no. You cannot vote for Party B. You cannot tick that box expressing your support for Party B. If you do, then your vote will be interpreted as the endorsement of rounding up the Hindus and killing at least half of them. So that's not possible. Maybe you'll think, oh, well, what am I going to do then? I'm going to join Party A, I'm going to join Party B, and I'm going to try and change it from the inside. I'm going to work my way up. I'm going to see if I can exert influence. But I would say, no, you can't do that. If you join Party B then your message to society is, I endorse Party B. 
I commend Party B to you. I recommend you vote for Party B. And you're basically saying, Hindu killing isn't a deal breaker for me. I'm willing to be a member of a party that wants to kill half the Hindus. And I would say, that's just wrong. That's a deal breaker. You cannot compromise on that issue. So what's the option? But the only other option is you've got to start party C. Haven't you? You've got to start party C. Now, if people say, you'll never get anywhere. The other parties have been going for ages. Everyone hates the Hindus, whatever. You know, It's not going to work. I think the right response is it doesn't matter. There is no option but to start party C, to offer the electorate a morally acceptable choice, regardless of the odds. Because at Holyrood, we've got five pro-abortion parties. And the question's got to be, I mean, my illustration was about these, these adult Hindus. Is all life equally valuable? The unborn and adults, if that's what we believe, then the argument I presented about the Hindus applies directly to Scottish politics. If you believe in the sanctity of human life, abortion should be a political deal breaker. Now, in my book, my book's very challenging on a lot of issues, but on this section, the book challenges the reader to stand in front of a mirror. So I hope people are going to do it, to so stand in front of a mirror with the book, look at themselves in the eye, and see if they can read out some of the following statements. This is one of them. I voted for a party that wants to continue the killing of unborn children because they were the ones most likely to beat the SNP here. Or... I'm a member of a party that wants to allow the killing of unborn children right up to birth because I'm concerned about climate change. Or, I urge you to vote for a party that wants even more unborn children to be killed because Scotland should be an independent nation. Can people in good conscience say those things? I believe a lot of people are not facing up to the facts. And it's our job to help people to understand the gravity of the issues. We've got to challenge people. A lot of people don't want challenging. They want to stay within the cozy, political, and controversial safe ground. Brock's case is really simple. Human life is valuable. It's interesting, the pro-life vigil I, uh, in Edinburgh, I went along a few times, uh, my wife organized it. I'd never done that sort of thing before. But quite often people would come along and they'd say, shame on you. And I think, you're really gonna have a hard job trying to make me feel ashamed for standing up for the, for the rights of the unborn. You're, you're really going to have to come up with something better than that. Now, of course, there's another front in the pro-life battle as well. Um, assisted suicide is rearing its ugly head again in the Scottish Parliament. It's a key issue. I've made a couple of videos about it recently. I have to say, to be honest, uh, the number of people watching the videos wasn't massive compared to some other issues. So I would urge you, I would urge those of you watching online as well, do take an interest in the issue. It's extremely important. Now, there's some MSPs in the Scottish Parliament who will argue strongly against assisted suicide because it's not career-ending. You don't get called a phobe or a bigot or whatever for arguing against assisted suicide. So we will hear opposition to assisted suicide in the Scottish Parliament. The campaign against it, I think, is going really well. Uh, but the flow, the tide of society is in favour of assisted suicide. In the Scottish Parliament, we've got two parties for it, our two premier parties of death, that's the Lib Dems and the Greens. Then we've got the SNP, who sort of put it in their manifesto that yes, they'd like to talk about assisted suicide, so they're sort of half open to it. And you've got the other two who are neutral. And I think neutral is not good enough. How many parties in the parliament are against it? Zero. If assisted suicide is introduced uh, this year or next year or whenever, how many of those parties were put in their manifesto to reverse it? I suggest none of them. We need principles, solid principles, driving political parties. That's why we need the Scottish Family Party in the Scottish Parliament. Now, one last thing on this. I took part in a debate the last time this was in the Parliament. It was eight years ago. And I debated with uh, Patrick Harvey, leader of the Scottish Green Party, and Liam MacArthur, the MSP who's brought forward the bill this time. And I said to them, imagine you're addressing a group of teenagers. And one of them put the hand up and said, do you think suicide is ever the best option when you're facing difficulties in life? I said, what would you say to that group? I said, I would say no. You can either say no, yes, or depends. So I say no, 
you, I assume, have got to say it depends. So what would you say to them? I asked them. And their answer was, well, you can guess. They didn't answer. Eight years later, I'm still waiting for an answer because they can't face up to the reality. And assisted suicide, it, it just surrounded by euphemisms. People will do anything to avoid describing what it really is. And that's just going into overdrive this time. So that is an issue to follow. Right, so now move on to part two. There's only two parts, by the way. So this is this part two. And I want you to imagine, I gave you a sheet of paper, a sheet of A4 paper, and said, write your life story on it. So you've just got a few hundred words. What would you have to say? You'd probably say you were, you were born to your parents, you were brought up by, maybe your parents together, was it a broken home, that, that, that sort of information. You might say a bit about your education, what qualifications you gain. You might say a bit about your career, you move from one job to another, maybe. You would talk about your relationships, that would be a really important part of your life story, wouldn't it? Maybe you got married, was it a happy marriage, was there a divorce, or, or whatever. So, so relationships would be a really important part of your life story. You'd maybe talk about moving from one part of the country to another. There might be health episodes that would make it into your life history. If you've had children, that would be a big part, wouldn't it? You had children, one on this date, one on this date, and then how are they doing? What's your relationship with them? How are they developing? That would be vital. Maybe if you're more mature in years, you'd write about grandchildren as well, a really important part of your life. How are they faring? That would be a big part. If, if you're in retirement, again, family relationships in retirement, I think are obviously uh, often very, very important to people. Now, not everyone's life story might include all those things for, for various reasons. That's absolutely fine. But most people would include those sort of things in their core life story, the most important aspects of their life. I would get, just as an aside, probably whether you had a bit more money or a bit less, probably wouldn't make it into your life story. Uh, but look at what was central to so many parts of your life story. It's family. It's family. And yet when the government looks at people, the government, uh, they, they want to help people. They want people to live fulfilling, happy, prosperous lives. But what do they focus on? Career. Okay, they try and get the economy, jobs available. Health. They provide a health service. Uh, trying to make sure people have got enough money. Yeah, okay, fair enough. In Scotland, they try and provide education. They make an absolute hash of it, but at least they're aware that that's something they should try to do. But what do they ignore? Your family in childhood, the success of your relationships in adulthood, of your marriage, your relationship with your own children, the strength of family life in general. In other words, the government's only focusing on half the picture. Half of what we see as most important in our lives, they're not interested in. Now, maybe at this point, you're thinking, good, that's the way I like it. Family life's none of their business. They can just butt out and leave us to it. Now, we're very much on your wavelength if you're thinking that. We don't want the state interfering in family life. The Scottish government treats parents like bungling amateurs and comes between children and their parents, tries to turn their children against their parents, and children are indoctrinated with dangerous ideas that are at odds with parents' values. So we're not wanting to interfere. We're wanting to create a culture where family relationships flourish, where families stick together, children know stability, parents can make choices about childcare, and families can embody their own values. At the moment, or sorry, we want a society where the state helps parents to fulfill the parents' vision. Whereas at the moment, we've got the state pressurizing parents to fulfill the state's vision. And that's a pretty important difference. Now, in Scotland, if a kid's drinking too much iron brew, the government's very concerned. They'll have policies, committees, reports, initiatives. That's a real high priority. Whether or not the, families, uh, the child's family falls to bits, they're not interested. They're not interested. Why aren't they interested? Well, it's partly just they've never considered the issue. Uh, they've never heard the case for marriage as the foundation of family life. They don't understand it. But there's a bit more to it than that. They hate the idea of anyone suggesting that marriage is in some way superior to any other family form, because that's judgmental. So in other words, the government can tell you what to eat, to drink, how much to exercise. They can tell you about any aspect of your life and suggest what you ought to do. But when it comes to the most important aspects, 
for children, for adults, for wider society, the crucial aspect, well, they back off because that's judgmental. You can't advise people in those areas. So they won't um, promote a culture of stable family life. It's against their principles because for them, being non-judgmental is more important than the well-being of children. But we, of course, beg to differ. We beg to differ. And that's why we're, you know, we're aliens on the Scottish political scene. That's why we're so at odds with them. That's why people find it so difficult to understand what we're about. Now, a couple of months ago, I was chatting to a young man um, at a church. And he worked for a homeless charity. And he was telling about me about his experience working with homeless people. That's quite interesting. And then at the end of the conversation, I shared with him some of my experiences with homeless people. Now, I'm going to tell you how this conversation went. Because when I was in my late 20s, I would say, when I was living in Edinburgh, um, I, I bought a flat with four bedrooms. Uh, a friend came and lived in the flat as well. So we had two spare bedrooms. And we decided that we would basically run it as a sort of unofficial homeless hostel. And we would try and find people who couldn't find somewhere to live or got some sort of problem, would find it difficult even keeping a place in a hostel. And we'd see what we could do with them. So we had another friend who worked in a sort of homeless daycare center. So we said to him, keep your eye open. See if you find anyone who you think would be, would be good for our, to come and live in our flat. So eventually this friend came along and said, right, I've got just the person, Rod. Um, Rod is the ideal candidate to come and uh, come stay in your flat, one of the bedrooms. So I met Rod a couple of times. I went to see him in his new flat. He'd been sleeping rough, but he'd got a new flat in Nidri. And in his flat, was no carpet and no furniture. In the living room, there was a TV and an ashtray and a sleeping bag on the floorboards. In the kitchen, there was no fridge, there was no cooker. There was a pint of milk in water in the sink, trying to keep it cool. And he took me for a tour around his flat. It was nighttime. He went from room to room. And when he went around, he had to take the light bulb with him. He'd only got one light bulb. So he took it from room to room to give me um, a tour. And I said to him, would you like to come and live at, at our house? And his face beamed. He was overjoyed to come and stay. And he, and he came and stayed with us. And it was challenging. He was diagnosed with Huntington's disease soon after he moved in with us. I don't know if you know about that. It's a degenerative neurological condition. It leads to involuntary movements that become increasingly violent and also a loss of emotional control. So they become very um, ill-tempered, shall we say. So the sort of things that would happen with Rod is he'd, he'd smoke in his room and flick his cigarette butts into the neighbor's garden. Then the neighbor would complain, and I'd say, right, I'm going to need to challenge Rod about it. So I'd say to him, now, you, you really need to get your cigarette butts in the ashtray. And I would know he was going to flare up. And it, it, so he would get really angry. It was quite comical as well. He would go to his bedroom to put his big boots on because he could, thought he could do more damage with those. So he'd put these big leather boots on. Then he'd come out again on the war path and uh, sort of launched some sort of attack. He wasn't very good at it because he was very uncoordinated. So we'd restrain him and he'd calm down. And then he'd apologize, often in tears. He'd say, oh, I'm really sorry, I can't help it. And that happened from time to time. There's a lot of fun with Rod as well. He used to live embarrassing me. One time we were in a department store and we were walking, uh, an assistant was walking the other way and he got the assistant. He said, excuse me, my friend here is looking for the ladies' underwear department, but he's, he's a bit embarrassed. Um, could you help him? So the, the assistant turned to me and said, oh, yes, it's just like that. Could have punched him. Um, so there's a lot of fun as well. I mean, our, our flat was, was uh, a sight to behold. It was very shaky. he would have really sugary coffee. He'd make it in the kitchen, carry it through the hallway, carry it through the lounge to where he was going. So our carpets were all sticky. It was like a student union bar. But then you go into the kitchen, and he would fry things really hot, fat flying everywhere. So you go into the kitchen and slip over. I mean, he treated the bathroom as his personal sauna. Uh, there's one time I got home, went into the bathroom um, just as the ceiling was in the process of collapsing <laughs> under, the, uh, under the weight of the, uh, the moisture. And we had all sorts of issues with the neighbors. They were quite concerned about things that he did, quite understandably, so a bit of a politi uh, political challenge, diplomatic challenge as well. Uh, there was a support worker that used to come and visit him sometimes. And we would have a chat with her as well. She'd have some tips for us. And one day she said to us, she said, I wish I could put everyone on my case list in a, in a place like this. She said, that would be ideal. Now, one day Rod 
who could, couldn't carry a copy cup across a room and had the most inflammatory temper you could imagine. He bought himself a car. So we thought, this is a disaster waiting to happen. I mean, this is going to all go wrong. Uh, disaster. What can I do? So I phoned the police. I said, here I am, Richard Lucas, 54 Cowan Road, Rod Simpson. He's bought a car. Uh, Rod's got Huntington's disease. There's no way he should be driving. Here's his doctor's phone number. You can phone up the doctor. Hear it for yourself. What can you do? And the policeman said, I can't do anything. So my friends and I thought, right, what do we do? Do we wait until he sort of plows into some queue of children at a bus stop or something? Right, we need to take the law into our own hands. I'd seen a film where uh, they wanted to disable a car, so they put sugar in the petrol tank. So I thought, right, it's worth a try. So we sneaked down in the middle of the night, and we put sugar in the petrol tank. And in case you're ever thinking of sabotaging a car, it, it doesn't work. Well, well, it might, well it, it, it's car stopped working out about, after about a week, so I'm not sure. But eventually it got more and more difficult. One time he turned really violent. We restrained him. He just wouldn't calm down. So we moved to live into um, a sort of NHS care centre. He was with us for about 18 months, I think. I used to visit him there. He was going downhill fast. The last time I saw him, there was just a flicker of recognition. Um, but then he moved to a different home and I lost contact with him. Um, it, sadly, he would have died uh, long ago. With his, the prognosis was not good. So remember, I started this. I said I was telling this story to someone. And after I told them this story, the person said to me, I see you in a really different light now. And I thought, afterwards, I thought, oh, what, what did he mean? And I think what he meant was, you've really gone up in my estimation. You know, I think you're a good person now. This is someone who knew about the Scottish family party. But the fact that I'd you know, helped out some homeless people, that, that was really, you know, that changed the way he saw me completely. But I think that's the deal in our society. If you help at a food bank, mentor some children with difficulties, visit the lonely or whatever, people will think that's great. Because it is. Because it is. If you want to make people's lives better through politics, people think that's great as well. As long as you don't go to any controversial areas, that's fantastic. If you want to make people's lives better through politics by challenging the consensus, by arguing against some of the ideas that are causing huge harm, and being controversial, then generally people think that's not so good. In fact, you're maybe even seen in a negative light if that's what you do. I mean, it's as if for a lot of people the priority is to be nice and to be liked rather than trying to improve people's lives. I'm not prepared to sacrifice the well-being of society in order to avoid controversy and to have people think, oh yeah, you're really great really love what you're doing. The truth is more important than that. So, <laughs> just thinking about Rod there, this chap that we helped out uh, for 18 months. I mean, when I'm involved in the Scottish Family Party now, and the days when I was involved with Rod in those days, to me it's the same thing. It's the same thing, it's the same project. The project is, to improve the lives of people. With Rod, the project was really intensive to try and improve the life of one person. With the Scottish Family Party, it's really intensive, but we're trying to improve the lives of many, many people. With Rod, we're trying to protect him from harm, with one person. With the Scottish Family Party, we're trying to protect many, many people from harm. Looking after Rod, that was quite a big commitment. The Scottish Family Party is a big commitment too. Looking after Rod had its dangers and its excitements. Um, running the Scottish Family Party certainly has those as well, but also they both have their huge rewards. Now with Rod, the prognosis was not good. Basically in terms of his physical health, there was no hope. I know physical health isn't the sum total of human uh, existence, but in terms of his physical health, the prognosis was not good. We were helping him through a stage of his decline. Is that what we're doing in Scotland? Is there no hope? Is the prognosis perpetual decline? Well, we've got to be realistic, haven't we? We've got to be realistic. How far have we got to go to stop the killing of unborn children in Scotland? How far have we got to go to stop the corrupting of children in school? How far have we got to go to re-establish a strong culture of marriage? How far have we got to go 
to restore real freedom of speech? How far have we got to go to create a nation where family relationships are in underpinned instead of undermined by the government? And the answer to every one of those is a long way. A very, very long way. But just going back to that conversation with the, the young man who worked with the homeless. In the same conversation, I said to him, now I understand people who are homeless, it's often drugs, alcohol, or mental health problems. They're the issues that result in people being homeless. He said, yeah, you're absolutely right. He said, but there's one more as well. He said, that's family breakdown. Family breakdown. And I thought to myself, well, this, these drug problems, alcohol problems, mental health problems, how many of those have stemmed from family breakdown as well? So really at the heart of the causes of the problems that he was seeking to address was family breakdown. And yet the Scottish Family Party's focus on family breakdown didn't connect somehow. But if we could strengthen family life in Scotland, the effects would be huge. You hear about statistics daily of problems, youth mental health, addiction, abuse, behaviour in schools, suicide, emotionally damaged children, etc., etc., etc. Now, as a political party, we can't overcome human nature. Things are going to go wrong. In families, things are going to go wrong for individuals. But if we could make any sort of dent in family instability and fatherlessness in Scotland, that would have a massive, massive impact. It's the missing piece in the political jigsaw in, in Scotland. Now, when I say missing piece in a jigsaw, you may be imagining like a thousand piece jigsaw with a bit of sky missing up here that's really irritating. And you think, right, I'm never buying a jigsaw from a charity shop again. It's not like that. This is like one of these kiddies jigsaws that's got about three pieces and one of them's missing. It's a massive aspect that's been neglected. Now, the Scottish Family Party, what we've got, it's not so much a dream, it's a vision. It's a vision that we're progressing towards. We've got an ever-growing team and we work towards it. It's a lot of hard work. There's no magic bullet. We've got a growing army of members and supporters. Our finances are becoming stronger and stronger. But there is no magic bullet. We're in this for the long haul. I mean, three or four years ago, to imagine having people here at a conference like this, all the speakers you've heard, it would have seemed impossible. The growth has been phenomenal. And that's what we need to continue. But we've also got to be thinking to the future. Thank you. We've got to think to the future. The babies to be born, families to flourish, children protected and nurtured. We've got to think most of the people who will benefit from our campaigning as the Scottish Family Party are probably not even being born yet. Not even being born yet. And that's our sole motivation, is to improve the lives of people in Scotland. We're certainly not here to get rich. There's been lots of stories in the media recently, haven't there, about politicians having these extra second jobs on the side or whatever, and those other career opportunities. It sort of works the opposite way around with the family party. I mean, the one career I did have has gone out the window. Um, we're certainly not here for um, accolades and awards. We're not going to be invited to any award ceremonies or given any medals or whatever. Um, they're certainly going to be few and far between. We're certainly not in politics so we can rub shoulders with the high and mighty. I mean, we're treated as outcasts by a lot of the political establishment. Uh -huh. What we're here, and this is my concluding note, what we're here for is to stand up for what's right, what's best and what's true. And that's enough for me, and I know that that's enough for all of you as well. Thank you.